Hello, everyone. So good to be um, seeing you, even though if it's uh, virtually I'm seeing you, it's still wonderful. And I feel like I really feel the energy of mindfulness through screen after attending Sangha, um, like long enough. So um, I'm really grateful for this calm energy. And it's 8 a.m. in Korea, so it's not too early, well being. <laughs> I like sleeping in, but 8 a.m. is pretty doable. So can everybody see the um, PowerPoint on the screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So today <laughs> I'm giving a talk titled The Flower, a oh, Lotus Flower and a Smile, Presence and Intimate Understanding. And this is me. Sometimes I joke that I shouldn't use this photo because it's too flattering. <laughs> I don't want to mislead anyone. Um, and I am honored to be serving as a center director and I'm honored to be bringing in my experience of uh, being a creative writing and literature instructor in the previous uh, chapter of my life as a mindfulness and um, creative activities are like, the passion of my life. And I hope you get to experience um, some joy in engaging in both of those. And what you can expect tonight is that I will first offer my reflection on Flower Sermon, a Buddhist story that is seen to be foundational to the Zen tradition and what the Zen, uh, what the Zen tradition stands for. And then I'll connect the reflection to the philosopher's take on what it means to deeply communicate beyond the conventionally expected capacity of language. This is where the literature stuff comes in. And to really feel the sense of deep communication and intimate understanding, we'll explore a creative exercise that relate our personal experiences to what came up tonight. And we'll open the floor for uh, optional sharing. So. I hope we get to do all of that, so I'll get going. I'd like to um, kind of share uh, my intentions about creative exercises uh, because you know uh, many people come here for meditation, it's in our name. Um, but I believe that mindfulness practice and creative practice go hand in hand um, to build our capacity to access the joy of being fully present and connecting with ourselves and with one another and more. So um, uh, I believe that experiencing this beautiful intimacy with the world and one another is the mindful practice and is meditation. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but when you arrive at Dallas Meditation Center, you see a sign, experience the joy of mindful living. So this is it, mindful living, meditation, um, connecting with one another and creative exercises. And I like to acknowledge, especially when we have a um, new visitor that Dallas Meditation Center's core gathering format are inspired by Plum Village tradition, which is inspired by East Asian Zen, which is why I'm connecting those ideas. Zen master, um, Venerable Ting Na Han, somehow, sometimes lovingly called Thai, is the founder of Plum Village tradition. And Brother Chi Singh is the founder of the Dallas Meditation Center. His vision was to bring mindfulness and meditation practice to people of all faith and non-faith secular backgrounds in an earth-based way with an emphasis on creativity, music, and the arts. So there's creativity again. And the three values that we honor here is generosity, creativity, inclusivity, and although we celebrate all three um, always, um, I think there might be a little emphasis on creativity tonight. So going back to the title, A Lotus Flower and a Smile, I'll emphasize that part. And here, I wanna just to take five deep breaths in this meditative way with our eyes landing on this image and see what comes up for you. Sensations, emotions, thoughts, whatever it may be. Let's take five deep breaths.
And let's take three breaths as we look at this image. Some of you may know what this is about, some of you may not, and that's okay. All right. Thank you for exploring this with me. Um, I wanted this uh, story to be kind of experiential. Uh, um, so this image is portraying the starting point of my uh, talk tonight. Yam Hwa Miso, also known as Flower Sermon, is a foundational story in Zen um, Buddhist tradition. And since I was young, I loved this story without knowing why. And I got to kind of explore the why as I was preparing this talk. So this is a uh, quote by um, Dr. Donald Lopez, uh, who is a professor of Buddhist uh, and Tibetan studies at the University of Michigan. Um, he kind of describes that Zen is famously about a special transmission beyond words and outside of scriptures. It is said to have begun with flower sermon when the Buddha silently held up a lotus flower for his silent Dharma talk, and only his disciple Mahaka Shapa smiled. And some interpret that to mean that he solely received the transmission of Buddha's wisdom, and that uh, and he is known as the first patriarch of Zen. So I just kind of wanted to best I could on Zoom format, what it's like to just look at that image of um, holding the lotus flower, this hand that is holding. And you'll see this image in your program too, because that's such a, a foundational image in Zen Buddhism. So revisiting this painting that is on the side of the um, temple, the, in Korean Buddhist temple, there's a lot of mural. And uh, <laughs> I like to say, Buddha is holding the lotus flower over here and looking, you know, very present. Um, and here he is uh, vibing together, as you can see with this golden halo. Um, and just there's just a subtle smile in both parties' face. And this is a beautiful story. And I also relate the story to my experience that I had at these with this performance artist at Thinking is Presence conference. It's this uh, very, um, how do I call it? Um, interesting um, experimental conference that literature folks created where people are exploring the presence of writers rather than the writing um, uh, to communicate with each other. And there was this uh, performance artist, I wish I could remember her name, but she read a poem about can you really encounter the ocean beyond the idea of ocean? Um, can you cut through the veil of concepts, experiences, but can you see what's before you here and now? And she made this like gestures and as she gave this like beautiful emphatic uh, reading of the poem that she was reciting. And then I don't know what it is, but I started crying. And there was something so special about communications that can happen between the presence who embodies what they wish to share. And another person just receiving understanding what is being shared. And I'm kind of making that connection between just like beyond the word kind of connect, kind of transmission of experience and wisdom that can happen because I'm still like, really curious as to why I felt so like touched by that moment. And I relate this to another personal anecdote uh, when I used to practice with um, the uh, Korean Zen Buddhist temple. Um, I was reading this book, Four Texts for New Buddhists. Um, and I had so many questions for um, the nun. And she was like, wait, wait, Jun Jun. Like, and she, she said, Beware, symbols and words can be addictive, but they're not as revelatory as the firsthand experience. So keep practicing. Stop going like, what does this mean? What does this mean? Uh, which is, that's kind of how my mind works. And I'll be doing some of that still. Uh, I can't help it. But um, again, Zen is emphasis on firsthand experience 
and this communing with one another and learning from something beyond texts and scripture. And uh, Brother Fat Lu from Plum Village has a wonderful um, talk that also um, conveys this idea. Um, so he gave a really interesting talk on the Diamond Sutra. Um, and he says, um, the aspiration of the monastic who composed this text um, was um, comes from this question of how can we recreate through the form of a text the experience of being near Buddha? How can we recreate the written form of any kind of awakening that is experienced by someone directly witnessing how the Buddha walked, how the Buddha talked, how the Buddha ate, and how the Buddha taught? So if the text seems a little difficult to understand, the intention of this writing is to, can we transmit that presence um, through the text? And he was holding um, the book of Diamond Sutra and was like, we want to say that text like this is, is the ultimate because it's concrete and uh, we can read it, uh, we can spend time with it with at our own pace. But Buddhist tradition continues through the realized practice of living human beings, not through words or text. So to recap, Zen Buddhism, which Plum Village tradition is inspired with, works with a special transmission beyond words, and Flower Sermon portrays an example of that special transmission of wisdom. And Brother Bap Lu um, says that, again, um, is the living, uh, realized practice of living human beings is what allows us to access the wisdom and um, the tradition continues on through living beings, um, even if there's a book that holds the text that was passed down to history for a very long time. But I keep asking, like, there are more questions. <laughs> That's, that's just kind of how my mind works. Um, so if not by words, how does teaching and wisdom transmit from one being to another? What's happening there? And how can we apply what we've learned here and now um, here to our practice of mindful living here and now? And what, what I mean by here and now is that, you know, like I personally don't have any like, like it's halo inducing level of mindfulness, but I still wanna learn from these stories. Um, if we were to take the flower sermon story to be about the direct transmission that is only possible because of some advanced skills, then I hit the wall um, and I can't quite relate and learn from this story. So how do we learn from flower sermon story here and now? And to me, um, I need a bridging agent um, to understand the story and really connect. Um, so I'm bringing in some translation and communication theorist, and I hope this will be helpful for you too. So this is where we go to the presence part of our talk. Um, to briefly touch on my intention, um, I see connection between philosophy of translation and, and mindfulness in that they both wrestle with the perception itself. And I hope this theory that I uh, find helpful in looking deeply into the nature of language that mediates our perception of the world, um, I hope you feel Probably June is still talking, not knowing that we don't get it. So we need to send her some, you know, psychic energy that says, you're not, we not hear you, we can't hear you. Where, uh, when did you guys lose me? <laughs> <laughs> the last word was. 
presence. You were just starting to talk about presence. Oh, and my presence went away. <laughs> um, <laughs> give me a second. Let's see. Breathing in, breathing out. Finding that presence. There it is. All right. Yay, presence. Um, so I was just sharing that um that the um the, the theories and quotes I'm bringing in is I think has this connection between the idea of looking deeply in Plum Village context where we see um this interconnected nature of everything thus that, that facilitates deeper understanding of what's before us. I was reading this quotes and everything, um, but I will uh, move forward for now after losing some time from Zoom shenanigan. Um, so George Steiner is a communication and translation um, theorist and philosopher that I really like. He, um, um, to me, he's looking deeply into the nature of language as he describes language to be a um, amalgam of public colloquial symbolic system and private personal symbolic system that derive from experience. So when multiple people are engaging in communication, even if it might seem that what's happening is transaction of meaning within the publicly agreed upon lexicon slash pool of meanings, there's always the private experience and presence of people involved in communication that are brought into the space. So, you know, like if I've never seen lotus flower and talk about lotus flower and try to talk about that idea, maybe, um, my private experience not being quite there, um, that's kind of lacking in communication. But if I brew lotus flowers and start talking about lotus flower, even if on the surface level, it might seem like I'm talking about lotus flowers, there's something that uh, I can bring in more because my life experience is part of communication um, that comes through the presence. Um, And um, he uses the word communication and translation kind of interchangeably because he believes that because all communication is beings carrying different experiences, using words slightly differently, um, infused with different experience, every communication is a form of translation that allows us to understand each other. And he's claims that um, it's always creative and interpretive process communication because we are encountering each other when we are communicating deeply. Um, he writes in kind of <laughs> crazy syntax. Um, let's, I'll just read it to honor his uh, writing style. And a model of communication at the same time, a model of translation of a vertical or horizontal transference of significance. Each living being's uh, person draws deliberately or in immediate habit on two sources of linguistic semiotic supply, the current Vulgate corresponding to its level of literacy and private thesaurus. So unpacking that anyone who's speaking, gesturing, communicating is drawing from their knowledge of colloquial symbolic system. Uh, if I say Lotus, you know what that means, but 
um, and private collection of meanings that are from the person's lived experience. So that is always infused into the space. So like my experience of Lotus is being transferred to you when I talk about Lotus. In other words, connecting, communicating always involve many layers of each presence and their lived experience and wisdom. And this is Roland Bart, my <laughs> philosopher crush, a really thoughtful Frenchman who talks about so many like different art in a thoughtful way. And he also talks about communication as intimate contact between two worlds. Language is a skin. I rub my language against the other. It's as if I had words instead of fingers or fingers at the tip of my words. This bodliness of language as Bart describes it reveals that communication is an intimate contact between two or more presence that are accumulation of all experience and that is akin to physical touch. So communication is intimate, um, especially when we bring our full mindfulness and presence into the communication. So this, I'm briefly circling back to the question that I posed earlier, how does teaching tr wisdom transmit from one being to another? Perhaps the transmission of wisdom was possible via the connection of two presences who brought all brought in all accumulated experiences and wisdom at that very moment. And that mindfulness, can you imagine the Dharma talk of Buddha? Everybody must be so present and they get, they're so available to connect. And maybe that is part of the picture of um, how you know wisdom can just um, transfer. And we reach the stage of this talk regarding intimate understanding. So recapping some ideas we explored so far, our presence carries all our experiences and wisdom. Mindfulness practice allows us to bring in the full presence here and now so that we can truly commune. And when we truly commune, we deeply communicate beyond our words. We can connect via our presence. But the question regarding flower sermon, at least for me, still remains. Why did only Mah Mahakashapa and not the other attendees receive the transmission? Remember how he had this like cool halo with Buddha and just like vibing, but everyone else was just kind of like, okay. He's holding a lotus flower, okay. You know? You could, we could ask the questions like, did he meditate the longest? Was it the smartest, the superior somehow than any others in the crowd? Why Mahakashapa? Why did he receive the, the transmission of wisdom in this story? My uh, reflection and my thinking was that maybe it's the relational field um, that helped uh, the transmission of wisdom here. Um, and this passage came to my mind. Um, after uh, Sariputta and Moggallana passed away, um, the historical Buddha um, addressed the group of monastics saying, Bhikkhus, um, this assembly appears to me empty now that Sariputta and Moggallana have attained final Nibbana. Although Buddha later on says that uh, Tathagata, sometimes the way he referred to himself, there's no sorrow from the duality of birth and death, but there is a sense of loss. The assembly appears empty to me. And I was wondering, what does he mean by empty? What does this mean? I wonder if what is lost from the assembly, the reason the assembly feels empty for Buddha, historical Buddha, was the loss of the relational field between the himself and his longtime disciples. Note, this is my personal speculation and interpretation. So it's not that perhaps um, those um, three disciples were just advanced in their practice that they could receive the teaching and the others couldn't, but perhaps the time that they spent together in Sangha together 
allows the transmission, the intimate understanding to be possible with a whole lotus flower, you get it because you've been with the historical Buddha and built that relationship. So if you were to entertain this theory of mine, um, communing in full presence in the, relations, in the relational field, the relationship amongst communicators over time seemed to be the key in deeply learning from one another. So I decided to call it intimate understanding. This transmission of wisdom sounds like, whoa, but it's more like intimate understanding. Like, I get you, I get you. And George Steiner also mentions intimacy as a bridging agent that it, when two intimate people who are intimate and know each other, um, there is less of a misunderstanding and misalignments of the way we, they communicate is as though intimacy is confident, immediate translation. And for me, this is really profound. I was asking myself, could it be that deep present relationship is essential in transmission slash exchange of wisdom, personal wisdom that we collected? Uh, could it be that the time we spend over time together allows deeper access to each other's wisdom, that the relational field is built over time as we spend more time with one another, practice with one another? Could it be that the true mindfulness practice is always relational? As a person who still considers her mindfulness practice to be largely personal, um, these thoughts feel like a revelation. revelation. Um, you know, like, um, I like adore Sangha, but I, and there is a refuge chant um, recognizes Sangha's essentialness, but to entertain this idea that the relationalness is, is just part of true mindfulness practice. I had this idea of solitariness in the way I lived my life. Um, uh, so this was a kind of a aha moment for me. And Brother Fab Lu returns um, and he, after describing that, um, Buddhism is about uh, passing the wisdom down through the realized um, presence. He says, if you want to realize the living Dharma, you need a community of practice. You can't do it alone. Like part of the way you learn wisdom is by communing with one another. So our deep listening practice that we, uh, we do here, mindful sharing practice, and creative practice all lead us to connect to the living dharma. This leads to the second question that I posed earlier. How can we apply what we learned here to our practice of mindful living here and now? So these are my take. Um, maybe other things came up to you during the talk. Um, so I've kind of put, phrased it this way. May we keep coming together as we practice and cultivate ourselves in presence of one another. May we nurture the Sangha, our space of deep connection. May we practice with our personal relationships, understanding that the time we spend with our loved one is part of our practice of cultivating intimate understanding of the world. May we honor the beings and memories, understanding that we draw our wisdom from all our relational fields. May we feel how much we owe our growth to our loved ones. So this is where I offer the creative practice as a practice that honors the intimate understanding we get to experience and learn from. So I titled it, Recreate Your Own Flower Sermon Experience. And quickly, my intention for this exercise um, is that the joy of mindfulness is not, doesn't, in my experience, doesn't come from seeking something new that I haven't tried. Those are fun too. But often joy of mindfulness comes from acknowledging the seed of joy that is already present in our lives. So here I invite us to look deeply into our past experience that is already embedded in, in our being and find the beauty in the intimate understanding 
and revitalize that memory with recreating with the creative process. So the step-by-step -step that I offer, although you don't have to follow it, uh, many have great uh, creative uh, instincts I've learned over time. Um, the invitation is that recall a memory of the time you received a caring gesture without having to say anything to another person or any beings. Pets, they are so in, like intuitive, um, they know things. Um, and think of the type of understanding that made you feel seen or cared for or loved, um, the type of understanding that comes with time spent together. And just to get your brain uh, motor going, uh, perhaps um, I'll give my example. After I come home from Dallas Meditation Center gatherings, I often come home to a glass of magnesium powder dissolved in water waiting for me on the kitchen counter. So I'm going to write a poem about magnesium supplement. <laughs> um, my partner knows that I tend to sleep poorly after giving talks or hosting an event. My mind gets really active. Um, and he learned this through observing and uh, started doing like making this magnesium powder water <laughs> um, out of uh, observation and caring. So when I come home, I smile upon the glass of water. And I see that I never had to ask to receive this compassionate gesture and that our relationship is part of how this glass of water that happens out of thin air um, came to be uh, waiting for me when needed. Um, so that's how I kind of call this the intimate understanding um, in my own flower sermon experience. I hold a glass of magnesium water and I smile because I get it. I get what this means. And I'm a, I like writing, so I used writing, but know that you can use drawing and I'm serious. You can like dance it out, um, <laughs> uh, whatever form of creativity that comes to you. Um, I want you to use that to explore this idea of when did I have this deep communing with another being where I felt seen connecting um, beyond words. Um, and even though I explained why that was meaning, my experience was meaningful for me, you don't have to in your creative process. Think of creative process as a medium that allows you to re-encounter your memory with this lens. And this is a poem that I came up with. The flurries of my thoughts swirl in the snow globe of my mind, but this glass of water holds his caring stir from earlier. As the glass waits, the spoon that he held rests. So this is the step-by-step -step, um, that I shared earlier. And maybe we can spend like 10 minutes-ish um, with the um, no. There were no pets given out, I believe. But uh, again, in whatever way that speaks to you, um, explore your creativity and see if you can connect to the idea of flower sermon connection beyond words. And um, yeah, and I'll um, uh, pause here um, as you explore this creative exercise.
More than a minute or so, um, but feel free to explore your process as long as you'd like. Um, I just will invite people to transition to sharing space in about a minute or so. And here I open the floor, um, hoping that um, we can hear some of your creation or uh, see whatever you decided to create. Um, and um, if you have something to share, feel free to um, bow and say your name and um, share however you'd like. Um, and let's see how this goes. Um, the, the incident that came to my mind was um, a few years ago I had uh, I had surgery that kept me off my feet and at home by myself for about a month um, and it just it wasn't it wasn't a good time for me and when I came back to my office some of my coworkers had moved to a tree from the lobby to into my office and they know I'm a cat person so they printed out lots of pictures of cats and hung trees like Christmas ornaments. Um, and I just you know walked into the office and saw that and I knew there was a lot of stuff waiting for me to do but that that just that made me feel fantastic and I remember that very vividly. Um, so that's that's what I wrote about. Returning from pain and loneliness to an infinite pile of anxiety and stress, cats and kittens weighing down branches of a tree look down on me like the benevolent gods they think they are, reminding me that I am never alone. <laughs> Thank you so much. That going in. The memory that came to my mind is when I was very young, like maybe nine years old or eight years old. Uh, I had gone to a school field trip and I was uh, tired and I was disoriented because um, I lived a very weird childhood because I didn't know I was 
blind until I was seven. Uh, before then, I thought that everybody saw the same things I did. And so <laughs> it was um, very disorienting. Um, there was this girl that uh, was a classmate of mine that made me feel um, really accepted. And uh, she <clears throat> let me uh, rest on her lap uh, on the way back because I was tired and I was confused. Um, so um, that um, was the first time that I felt safe. And then <clears throat> later on in teen my teenage years, of course, I felt disoriented again. But then I, um, towards my late 20s, I started feeling stability again. And so I um, now realize that nothing lasts forever. And that in itself is stability. And then bowing out. Thank you so much. So lovely to hear people engaging um, their experiences and yeah, the beauty of it all. Hi, my name is Shinsa Perry. She's very smooth, Holly Woodbury, but she doesn't say many words. She's about two and a half, but she loves to say no. So she knows exactly what she wants at all times. And then she'll walk into the room, be a bunch of adults, and then she'll point at someone, do this sign. That means you're chosen and you have to go play with her. <laughs> and so she finally did it to me. That was just like a aha uh, moment because in like the pureness of a beautiful little child, them choosing you for whatever reason, they want you, they want you to play with them. It's just very, feel really see. But in general with kids, because they learn through copying you. So I pictured my kind of flowers sermon with a um, blueberry up on stage to do something I call the chicken dance. But I wish I make her laugh, but I do like a little <laughs> chicken dance, and then she copies me, and it's just like these people in her like sleep room that we just chicken dance around. And, um, it was just a very beautiful moment where I see seeing no words, no nothing, just your little messy spirits. So mm -hmm. we're up on stage doing chicken dance, and everyone just kind of like, watches. Oh, that really warms my heart. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we might have time for another share our questions or um, if anybody wants. I'm sure I wrote first and I'll explain it. When I hit my dog in the head with a shovel, she ran over to comfort me. I never needed to say it was an accident, and she never needed to say she forgave me. We just resumed our game of being more careful. And obviously, you know about um, the sort of my dad, when I was a teenager, I was out in the backyard playing with a shovel in a ball, throwing up and whacking it. My dog thought that'd be great fun, and so I threw the ball up, and as I was swinging, she ran up for the ball, and I clocked her. And after she got the days off the ground, the first thing she did was ran up to come for me. And, and I thought at that moment that, you know, um, as I said, I mean, it was just so clear. I felt that was kind of an uh, understanding between us. You know, she knew it was an accident. And uh, it was just a nice moment. All the sides of the violence that started. so much um if somebody has a really itch that they wanted to share and didn't get to i'll hold the floor open for three breath otherwise we'll move on to closing soon i know where you'll go you know where i'll go Better than me, it seems like surprise. 
We know each other's ways so well, my friend. Why don't we know when we'll cross paths next time? Oh, uh, had lunch with a friend that I hadn't seen for probably two and a half, three years yesterday. And I think, at least for me, you know, I go through life, it's, it's just this marvelous experience, you know. It's, the more spontaneous I can make it, you know, people try to tell me to end the movie, I'm like, no, 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 don't ruin it for me. Like, I, I go I go through life like that. So, so much of it does feel like a surprise or a revelation, so to speak. But when you see, when you have a deep intimacy with someone, a deep knowing, Sometimes they can see in you your own future. And so, and something you can see in them their own future. Or maybe it's potential that you see. So, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when you when you embrace a friend that you haven't seen in a long time. And uh, we're sitting down and we're eating lunch. And we're catching up. And, you know, hey, how, what, what, are, you know what, what have you been up to? You know, what have I been up to? Maybe, maybe the small, you know, modular details of things. Maybe, maybe we don't know those things. But in, in truly knowing a person, I don't think any anything that I say was a surprise. Nothing about what he's done in the last two years surprised me. So you know what I mean. I think that's a, a deep knowing that you that you can experience with a person. Thank you so, so much. Um, I hope this uh, reflections and hearing people share continues the ripple effect of continued um, reflections on the beauty of our deep knowing, intimate connections and exchange of wisdom. Um, the opportunity is always there. So this is my thank you uh, for offering your whole self to this collective reflection and practice. May we practice connecting with one another in our full presence because we learn from each other. So we may intimately understand our interbeing presence, under, um, intimately understand that our interbeing presence is the Dharma. And here I will bow out. Um, thank you so much for being here. Really, really lovely.